Make sure you're hydrated, because I'm about to turn the heat up. This is my attempt to overcome a hardcore Nuzlocke of Pokemon Y with only Fire-type Pokemon. If you aren't familiar with the rules of a Pokemon Hardcore Nuzlocke challenge, I've laid them out in the description of this video, so take a look. I meet some new friends, and am faced with the most important decision of the entire run, my nickname. They suggest K Meister and Lil K, but I've got a much better idea, Special K. I pick the Fire-type starter, Fennekin, and sticking with the serial theme, nickname it Frosties. Our mother is infatuated by some neat handwriting and is all too happy to send us out into the world. On Route 2, I catch a Fletchling named Fruit Loops. It doesn't gain a fire typing until it evolves though, so I won't be able to use it for now. While our squad is rolling through the Santaloon Forest, I add Pantir to the team and name it Coco Pops. Once reaching Santaloon City, I can tackle the first gym. The leader uses bug types, but you'd be wrong to think that this is easy. Viola leads with a Surskit that knows Bubble and Water Sport, two dangerous moves for my fire types. I'm confident that Surskit is going to use Water Sport, so my strategy is to stall this out. I lead Fennekin and use Tail Whip twice, followed by Howl twice. I'm then able to bring Surskit to low HP just as Water Sport ends. Viola drains her potion, but I finish Surskit with one more scratch. This leaves only Vivalon. I can't afford to be locked in by Infestation, as Fennekin's HP is low. So I switch into Panzeer, and a few Incinerates is enough to finish the battle. With my first badge secured, I'm clear to continue onwards. The next gym is really, really far away though, so let me give you the highlights. After defeating Professor Sycamore, I'm gifted a Charmander. It's a great Pokemon, just be sure to keep it out of the rain. And yes, I'm absolutely sure that I'd like to give it the nickname 16 Wheat Picks. I'm also given the Mega Y Stone, which is only obtainable in this game. I wanted this stone over the X variant, as Mega Charizard Y has better synergy with my team, largely due to the Drought ability that it gains when Mega Evolve. After meeting Super Saiyan Gogeta in the lobby, it's time to move on. I was able to buy a Firestone, and leveled my team on the next few routes. This allowed me to evolve Fennekin into a Braxen, Pansy into Simiseer, Charmander into Charmeleon, and Fletchling into Fletchinder, who now has a Fire Typing, meaning I can finally use it in battle. I'm then treated to a daytime fireworks display. Surely that has to be pretty underwhelming, right? Did I mention that this part of the game is long? Like really long? Eventually, I reach Silage Town where the next gym is located. But before that, I can sneak onto the next route to get my next encounter, Eevee. I use a Firestone to immediately evolve it into a Flareon, and this little guy is going to be vital in my strategy for the next gym. Grant uses Rock-type Pokemon, and he's really tough to deal with, as Rock Tomb will rip my team apart while also lowering my speed. Bad news. Grant leads with Amora. I go with Flareon and use Baby Doll Eyes, a priority move that lowers my opponent's attack. This nullifies Amora's Rock Tomb and Takedown, leaving it only with the not very effective Aurora Beam. I then switch into Simiseer and land a Yawn. I'm paralyzed in the process, but can finish Amora while it sleeps with a few Incinerates. Tyrant is next, and this guy is the real problem of Grant's team. Similar to Amora, I land a yawn and aim to stall with Protect until Tyrant falls asleep. But my paralysis kicked in, and Tyrant finished Simiseer with Rock Tomb. You did good, Coco Pops. With Tyrant asleep, I go with Charmeleon and land two Dragon Rages to finish the fight and earn my second badge. I was gutted to have lost Simiseer there, as it had some great support moves. After having a bowl of Coco Pops in his honor, I had to continue moving through Kalos. In Geosenge Town, I defeat the gym leader Karina and, hey wait, where are you going? Give me my badge. Anyone who stands this close to a mirror and stares that intensely at themselves must be asking some deep existential questions. What is my purpose? Am I truly free? Is water wet? In Shalau City, we meet up with Mega Man and after defeating Serena, I'll need to take on Karina, again. Pretending I'm a Superman. Karina's fighting type Pokemon are really tough. I'd like to rely on Brace and Psybeam, but my minus special attack nature really limits my sweeping potential. Instead, I've got another plan. My Fletchinder has the Flame Body ability, which has a chance to burn the opponent when hit. This will halve me and Fu's physical damage, so I use Growl until it's eventually burned. I continue to lower its attack, and then pivot into Brakeson. Me and Fu can barely hurt me, leaving me free to use Howl until my attack is at plus 5. From here, it's an easy sweep of Karina's team, giving me badge number 3. In addition to the third badge, Karina gives me a friendship bracelet, and one of her Lucario decided to team up with me in a Mega Lucario showdown. 
I feel pretty dirty using a non-fire type Pokemon, but with the power of friendship, I'm victorious. Lucario stares deeply into my eyes, begging to join my team, but I'm sorry Lucario, okay? You're not a fire type. It's not you, it's me. Stop looking at me with those loving eyes. Anyway, this is where the beauty of the game really takes hold. Just look at the physics on those udders. It took a team of hundreds over at Game Freak to capture this. Utterly brilliant, 10 out of 10, game of the year. Now in Coomarine City, Serena wants a rematch, but her team is the same as before, and I can buff my Brakeson's attack with Howl, and then sweep with Return. Unfortunately, I couldn't help but overlevel my Brakeson in this fight, so I won't be able to use it in the upcoming gym. But I'm not too worried, as the leader uses grass types, so the rest of my team should be able to handle it. I feel like Tarzan flying through this gym. I lead with Fletchinder due to its 4 times resistance to grass. A fly removes Jumpluff without much trouble, but Go Goat survives a hit and puts me at low health. I know that Ramos will heal this turn, so use Return for some small damage, and a fly on the next turn gets the job done this time. Last is Weepin' Bell, but its limited offense allows me to switch into Charmeleon and end the fight with one Flame Burst. With Ramos' Garden burnt to a crisp, I've now got my fourth badge. After the battle, Fletchinder evolved into its final form, Talonflame. Just down at the beach, ready to enjoy my hot chips and... Ah, where did all these seagulls come from? Next, I need to pass through the Badlands, but my word, does this area suck? There are encounters everywhere, I hate it here. Eventually, I reach the power plant and have to grind through a gauntlet of Team Flare battles. During this, Charmeleon reached level 36 and evolved into Charizard. I give it the Mega Y Stone and yield the power of friendship to Mega Evolve. Witness the power. There are so many Charizard forms now that it made me wonder just how far will they take it. For the inevitable next form, I'd like to make my own suggestion. Charizard Australian Edition. Fully equipped to deal with the Australian harsh upside down climate. In the comments, give me your most ridiculous Charizard form ideas. The more abstract, the better. After handling Team Flare and their Cyclops Chief, I'm free to return to Lumio City where I can now challenge the gym. The puzzle involves a little game of who's that Pokemon and jeez, I don't know about this one. It's some form of mouse, possibly electrified, but there are just too many choices. While taking on the gym trainers, Brakeson evolved into Delphox who gains a secondary psychic typing. This childlike inspector gadget of a gym leader uses electric Pokemon which is really threatening for my two flying types. I lead Delphox and use Mystical Fire on Emolga. I land a fortunate crit, but this wasn't really material to my strategy. Magneton is next, and it's a little tricky due to its sturdy ability. I use this to my advantage though, and hit it with Mystical Fire, which not only does big damage, but also lowers Magneton's special attack. Clement continues to drain his Hyper Potions, and I nerf his special attack by 3 stages. I'm now clear to switch into Charizard, and comfortably live a Thunderbolt thanks to Magneton's lowered stats. After Mega Evolving, Magneton is easily cleaned up. This leaves only Heliolisk. I can't guarantee a one-hit kill with Flame Burst, so use Protect to stall one turn. Thanks to its Dry Skin ability, Heliolisk takes some small damage from the sun. This chip damage makes all the difference, and I'm now guaranteed to finish it off with Flame Burst on the next turn. It was a little dicey, but Mega Charizard is already paying dividends. I ventured into the Badlands again to try to get my Slugma, but no, I hate this place. So, so much. Pressing onwards through Route 14, I reach the spooky house. The man asks me, can't you see them? Behind you? A horde of faceless men? At the end of the route, I reach Levere City and can now take on the next gym. Valerie uses fairy types, but her lead is a very non-threatening Morwile. It can barely damage Charizard, allowing me to max my attack with Swords Dance before sweeping the rest of the gym. That was disgustingly easy. After saving the Pokeball Factory, the owner gives me a choice of reward, and obviously I pick the Big Nugget. Who needs a Master Ball when you have no encounters anyway? Speaking of, the Lost Hotel on the following round actually does give me the chance to catch something for the first time in forever. I'm able to find and catch a Litwick, which I nicknamed Cheerios. A few levels allow it to evolve into a Lampin. It can evolve once more, but there's no easy way to get a Dusk Stone at this point in the game, so we'll be stuck with Lampin for now. To make the best of this, I give Lampin the Eviolite to increase its bulk. At the end of Route 15, I reach Dendermill Town, home of the Move Deleter. I am so glad to finally be able to get rid of these HMs. After taking care of my rival once more, it's time for the 7th Gym. This is the trippiest place I've ever been to in a Pokemon game. 
The gym leader has a real final boss aura about her, but in reality, her team doesn't quite live up to that. Olympia's lead is a Sigilyph, which only knows two attacking moves, both of which are special. I can use Delphox's Confide to nerf it into the ground. This lets me pivot into Talonflame and max my attack with Swords Dance. A Roost helps me stall out Reflect, and the rest of Olympia's team fall to a few super effective thieves. I swipe my 7th badge, and am rewarded with the highly valuable Calm Mind TM. Lissandre gives us a friendly heads up that he plans to eradicate every non-team Flare member of society. Why would you tell us that? Just do it already, coward. Anyway, as is tradition, it's my job to set things right, and I'll need to pursue Team Flare. The next portion of the game has some tough battles, and I'll need all of the help that I can get. So, I decided to bite the bullet, and once again head back to the Badlands. After breaking rocks for a small eternity, I finally catch a Slugma. While leveling, it evolved into a Makago, and I use the move reminder to teach it Yawn. Makago has some pretty bad stats, but who knows, maybe I can get some use out of it. While raiding Team Flare's base, I undergo a painful number of battles with 5 different admins and way too many grunts. Their biggest crime is boring me to death with the absolute onslaught of battles. Anyway, let's jump to the juicy bits. Lissandre's prisoner recounts the harsh tale from 3000 years ago and I'm not crying, it's just the rain on a sunny day in my office. Next up is the penultimate fight with Lissandre. His Mianxia lead can be dangerous with Swords Dance, so I use Will-O-Wisp with Delphox to nerf its attack. This allows me to pivot into Talonflame and boost my attack with Swords Dance. I had to risk getting hit by a crit, but once my Citrus Berry pops, I'm free to sweep with Acrobatics, just as planned. The big bad Yveltal then makes its appearance. I like to think of it as the Bacon Strip Pokemon. I take Yveltal down with Charizard, but the game forces me to catch it, so my hands are tied. Hope it likes hanging out in the PC. Lissandre reappears and good god I leave you for 5 minutes and you come back looking like Dr. Octopus. Get it together man. I'll have to take Lissandre on for one final time, but here's the thing, I didn't realise that I couldn't change my lead after the Yveltal fight. Ideally, I would have used the same strategy as last time, but this really puts me on the spot. I stay in with Charizard and use Swords Dance to max my attack before Mega Revolving. I can easily remove Mianxiao and the Pyro that follows. I could take Honchkrow out too, but Charizard isn't equipped to deal with the Gyarados that will follow. As Honchkrow has 4 physical attacks, my plan is to switch into Makargo and stall with Recover until it's burned by Flame Body. Fortunately, this happens right away, so I pivot it once more into Flareon and use Baby Doll Eyes 3 times. At this point, Honchkrow is about as threatening as a light breeze, and I can freely switch into Talonflame and max my attack. Last is Mega Gyarados, but I'm guaranteed to outspeed and finish the job with my incredibly buffed Fruit Loop. It didn't go exactly as planned, but it all worked out in the end. With that taken care of, the rest of my gym challenge awaits. On my way to the next town, I was able to find a Dusk Stone, which I can use to evolve Lampant into a Chandelure. I also found my next encounter, Torkoal. Unfortunately, Torkoal in Gen 6 doesn't have the Drought ability or Body Press, so it won't quite live up to the godly reputation that it earned in my Sword Mono Fire Nuzlocke. Just before the next gym, Shauna and the other unnoteworthy members of our gang want one final showdown. This is actually really difficult, as we have to take them on back to back to back. They've got a diverse selection of Pokemon, and I won't be able to change my lead, so it's crucial that this goes to plan. My lead is Makago, but that's more for battles 2 and 3. Shauna is actually quite free. I can burn her Delcaddy to limit its offense, before switching into Charizard and setting up with Swords Dance. From here, it's an easy sweep. Tierno is tough, mainly due to his Crawdaunt, which has a great typing for countering my team, along with some hard-hitting stats. I could take Talonflame out with an Ancient Power, but I need to use it to set up. Makago lands a Yawn, and once Talonflame is asleep, I introduce my own Talonflame and use Swords Dance. With this setup, the rest of Tiano's team falls in a few turns. Last is Trevor, and his Aerodactyl horrifies me. With Crunch and Ancient Power in its moveset, Aerodactyl has great coverage for my team. I'll need to set up again, but Trevor's Raichu lead makes this very difficult. It can hit my sweepers with Thunderbolt for big damage, and paralyze them with Nuzzle. My Makago tanks a Thunderbolt, and sets up Yawn. I then pivot into Delphox, and make use of Raichu's sleep turns to land 4 Confides, massively nerfing its special attack. A switch back into Makago lets me land another Yawn, and a Recover allows me to stall out the 1 turn delay. With Raichu asleep, I switch into Talonflame, and set up a Substitute. This will prevent me from being paralyzed by Nuzzle. 
My setup requires Raichu to sleep for 3 turns, but if it doesn't, I can always switch back into Makargo and repeat the process. Fortunately, I was able to finish my setup the first time around, and from here, Talonflame pulls out its broom and sweeps Trevor back into the background where his character belongs. It's been a while between gyms, but I'm finally ready to claim the last badge. The leader uses ice types, so let's introduce him to a little fire. Honestly, this gym was a walk in the park. I was below the level cap and didn't even bother to Mega Evolve. A few flamethrowers from my team gives me an easy 8th badge. Now bound for the Pokemon League, I next head over to Route 22 where I can catch a Litleo. I'll need a Surf user in my team for Victory Road, leaving me with only 5 usable Pokemon for this portion of the game. Before I can begin, I'll need to take down the Victory Road Gatekeeper, whose team looks like it was built solely to counter mine. He has a Rock type, Water type, and Electric type, which is bad news. I get around this by teaching Delphox Calm Mind, and use this to buff my stats. The rest of his team are special attackers, so I'm free to finish the battle with some boosted psychics. Now clear to enter Victory Road, I avoid as many battles as possible before being faced by Serena for a final showdown. Most of our battles have been bland, but this one didn't quite go to plan. I lead Makargo and plan to put Meowstic to sleep with Yawn, but it uses Fake Out and my Flame Body ability leaves Meowstic with a burn, meaning it can no longer be put to sleep. I decide that my best option is a pivot into Delphox to land multiple Confides, nerfing Meowstic considerably. A pivot into Charizard lets me get the plus 6 attack as Meowstic falls to the burn. Next up is Greninja, who I expect to water shuriken, so I Mega Evolve to set up the sun. Greninja actually goes for Dark Pulse, but I just hang on and finish it with an insanely boosted Dragon Claw. Altaria also goes down to a Dragon Claw, but Serena's last two Pokemon have Quick Attack, and I'm at low HP. A switch into Makargo lets me burn Absol with Flame Body. I bring out my other sweeper, Talonflame, with the intention of setting up. But Absol landed two crits, meaning that I'm in range of a Quick Attack. Switching back into Makargo, I stall out the rest of Absol's burn with Recover, and can take Flareon down with a few Ancient Powers. That fight definitely didn't go my way, but surely I'm due for some good luck, right? The final stretch of Victory Road has three unskippable trainers, and this one horrifies me. Veteran Timio only has two Pokemon, but the second is a Gigalith with Sturdy, as well as both Earthquake and Stone Edge in its moveset. I've got a plan to counter this though. I put Trevenant to sleep with Yawn, and switch into Delphox. If I can set up a substitute, I'll easily overcome Gigalith with Grassy Knot. Problem is, Trevenant woke up really quickly and broke my substitute. No problem, I'll just switch back into Makargo and try again. Makargo, what have you done? Now I can't put Trevenant to sleep, and have no other way of setting up substitute on Delphox before Trevenant dies to the burn. Out of options, I try setting up a substitute anyway, but naturally, Trevenant rakes this as it finally succumbs to the burn. Sturdy prevents me from taking Gigalith out in one turn. I could switch around to my flying types in hope that it misses a stone edge, but that's unlikely and the potential losses could be huge. After considering my options, I said my goodbyes to Delphox and sent it onwards towards its death. I'm sorry Delphox. Charizard was able to finish Gigalith, and the final two trainers of Victory Road weren't much trouble. I'd made it to the Pokemon League, but the feeling was bittersweet. Losing my starter so close to the end is heartbreaking. From a team building perspective, Delphox is a huge loss. I needed to reassemble my team before taking on the Pokemon League. After strategizing, I was ready for the Pokemon League. The basic idea of my team is that Talonflame and Charizard are my sweepers, but the other four Pokemon each play a crucial role in supporting them. I can tackle the Elite Four in the order I choose, so I'll be starting with my safest fight, the Steel-type user, Wickstrom. His Klefki lead is very weak, and I can abuse this to set up. It does no Torment though, which prevents me from using the same move twice in a row. This is problematic, so I've included Protect in my moveset, which allows me to counter the Torment by simply protecting on every second turn. Klefki's laughable offense allows me to set up a substitute, and increase my attack with Swords Dance. On the next turn, one Flame Charge takes it down. Probopass has the Sturdy ability, which is a problem, as letting it land a single Power Gem will spell the end of Talonflame. Fortunately, the substitute that I set up earlier eats this attack, and a second Flame Charge takes Probopass down. The rest of the fight is clean, and I easily wrap up Wickstrom's team without breaking a sweat. Next is Malva. As a Fire-type user myself, I can at least appreciate the decor. It's a Fire-type mirror match, and we both lead with Pyroar. 
My goal is to use Noble Roar to mitigate both its attack and special attack. I'm able to get it to minus 6 without any trouble and pivot into Makargo. A Yawn puts Pyroar to sleep, allowing me to once again switch into Talonflame and max my attack. Once my Citrus Berry pops, Talonflame can't be stopped and the rest of Mulva's team collapses to a few acrobatics. Next up is the Dragon user, Drasna. She looks so friendly if you ignore the giant fangs hanging all over her body. Drasna's lead is a special attacker, Dragalgi. It has no status moves, so my aim is to nullify its offense with Pyroar. I lend a few noble roars, but my health is getting low, so switch into Flareon to nerf Dragalgi even further with Confide. Once at minus 6, it's Charizard's time to shine. I set up Substitute, which acts as insurance against critical hits. I then begin boosting my attack with Swords Dance. Once maxed, Dragalgi finally breaks my Substitute, but I'll need to set up another if I want to sweep. But on the next turn that I was exposed, Drasna hit the 10% chance for Thunderbolt to paralyze me. This cripples my original plan, but Charizard can still lay down some huge damage, finishing Dragalgi with Dragon Claw. Alteria breaks my substitute, but also falls in one turn. Noivern could KO me with a crit, but I can't afford to switch, and fortunately, land my Dragon Claw to finish it off. I need to preserve Charizard, so we'll have to find another way to deal with Dredigan. An eventual switch allows Flareon to land a Toxic while barely surviving a critical hit. Once Stratagon's health is low enough, Talonflame is able to come in and finish it with Acrobatics. That paralysis was awfully unfortunate, but somehow I made it through. The final course of the Elite Four is the water user, Seabold. I've saved the worst for last. My plan is similar to the other fights, but the setup for this one is longer, so there's more room for failure at the hands of bad RNG. Interestingly, Charizard fills an unfamiliar role of lead support Pokemon this time around. I've taught it Confide to nerf Clawwitz as offense, and by Mega Evolving, I set up a Harsh Sunlight to reduce the power of Water-type moves. By pivoting Charizard at just the right time, I can guarantee that the Sun stays up while trying to manage Clawwitzer. Once it's at minus 6, I switch into Charizard to re-establish the Sun, and then into Talonflame to begin my setup. Two Swords Dancers and a Substitute means I'm good to go and can finish Clawwitzer with Acrobatics. Next is Barbarical, who I can't finish in one shot, but the Substitute eats an attack and I can finish it on the next turn. The last two Pokemon are no match for my boosted Talonflame, giving me the win and securing my ticket to take on the champion. Diantha's diverse team lineup makes her a little tricky to handle. You may have noticed that I haven't used Chandelure yet, and the reason for this is that I've been preserving it for this very fight. Diantha's Howlucha lead can be deadly if it gets rolling with Swords Dance. To counter this, Chandelure uses Taunt to prevent status moves and issues a burn with Will-O-Wisp, nullifying Howlucha's offense. After a second Taunt, I pivot into Charizard and begin setting up Swords Dance. I reach plus 4 attack, but am poisoned in the process. Diantha heals, but one boosted Dragon Claw can finish Howlucha. Tyrantrum goes down to an Earthquake, bringing Aurorus to the battle. An Earthquake is enough to finish it too, but my Charizard finally succumbs to the poison. You did good, Wheat Bix. Rest easy. Next is Gorgeist. I go with Makago and issue a Yawn before switching into Talonflame. While Gorgeist sleeps, I max my attack and finish it with an Acrobatics. Gudra suffers the same fate, and Diantha's Mega Gardevoir can't handle the power of Fruit Loops. With that, I'd beaten Pokemon Y under Hardcore Nuzlocke rules with only Fire-type Pokemon. I had a lot of fun with this run. Even though Talonflame and Charizard swept a lot of the fights, without the support Pokemon around them, it wouldn't have been possible to make it this far. Who was your MVP of the run? Let me know in the comments. If you enjoyed this challenge, be sure to subscribe as it really helps the channel. Take care, and I'll see you in the next video.